Uh, all of the money for Wall Street, uh, for uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, came from Wall Street, uh, really from Rothschild firms, but uh, it would have been too obvious if the Rothschilds of London were sending all their money over to Russia to help the communists. So they did it through uh, their favorite patsy, which is uh, the American government. And um, they even formed a special uh, firm on Wall Street uh, in 1916 to finance the communist revolution in Russia, which was called American International Corporation. And its directors were Percy Rockefeller, uh, the richest men in the United States, including a financier named George Herbert Walker, who just happened to be the grandfather of George Bush, our president. Now, how does this George Bush fit in now? George Herbert Walker Bush, the former president, or about to be president of the United States, formerly anyway. How does he fit it with his father, and was it his father, and the Rockefellers, and the Harrimans, and the Brown Brothers? Did they all work together as far as this New World Order is concerned? Well, the New World Order is a group of insiders. It's sort of an international mafia. And they either work together or they get eliminated. I mean, these people have to cooperate because the death sentence is automatic if you don't. And uh, you don't say, I'm going my way to heck with you, because uh, if you go your way, your way is straight down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, George Bush was like a lot of scions of these World Order families. That is, he was unemployable. I mean, if uh, he came in to be interviewed uh, and there were eight people there, he would be the eighth one that you would hire if you had to hire eight people. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson... He uh, should have had seven others when he was <laughs> running for president of the United States. Well, it's too bad. <laughs> too bad it didn't. Lyndon Johnson was quite a perceptive guy. He was a Texas redneck. And uh, he came to Washington, and he looked at all these bright young men at the Central Intelligence Agency who were from the wealthiest families in the United States. They were there as a lark. They wanted to play James Bond, and their families uh, would do... Uh, and as uh, Lyndon said, he said, the CIA is composed of... Uh, scions of wealthy families whose families would never dare let them near the business because it would be dissolved within six weeks. So George Herbert Bush, uh, uh, George Herbert uh, Walker Bush, uh, when they, you know, he finished at Yale and they said, well, should we put him in the family firm of Brown Brothers Harriman? They said, good God, no, we'll be in the bread lines within two months. So uh, they said, let him go work, let him do what everybody else does, go work for the Central Intelligence Agency and travel around and have fun. So George went to work uh, for the CIA. It's the only job he ever had, just like Bill Buckley, another scion of a wealthy family. Uh, Bill Buckley was hired by the CIA when he finished at Yale, Skull and Bones. We're talking about the Brotherhood of Death here, the Skull and Bones crowd, mm -hmm. which Bill Buckley and George Bush and all of the partners at Brown Brothers Harriman were members of this um, Illuminati fraternity uh, mm -hmm. established in 1848 as the Russell Trust by Daniel Court Gilman, uh, to also, by the way, later set up the charitable foundations. Uh, Gilman was on the board of uh, all of these char so-called charitable foundations, which were simply secret instruments of the world order. So George became a member of the CIA. Matter of fact, he was CIA director in 1976. An interesting thing happened to Eustace in 76, and that was when he met one Saddam Hussein, who became involved in power in Iraq at the time. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, George was always a business partner of Saddam, and he claimed he didn't know him, so he deliberately, when he was on camera, he always mispronounced his name. He always called him Sodom, uh, as though he were trying to call him a Sodomite. I don't know. But anyway, they have been business partners that goes way back. And uh, Sodom himself, you know, is worth about $10 billion. He's a player on the world scene. And that's why when George was ranting about uh, getting rid of the new Hitler and he sent our army over there to do it, they walked away leaving uh, Saddam Hussein in total control. Uh, I don't think he ever heard a gunshot fired during that entire Iraqi war. But uh, to get back to George, he didn't uh, start out uh, with the CIA. He started out as an agent, a secret agent of the CIA, who was running his own oil company called Zapata Oil Company. And, uh, you know, George, when he wanted a name for his company, he wanted a name that really represented what he believed in. So he didn't call it the Thomas Jefferson Oil Company, and he didn't call it the George Washington Oil Company. Uh, he looked down at Mexico where you had a communist revolutionary named General Emiliano Zapata. 
And Emiliano was quite a bloodthirsty guy. Uh, his idea of a good time was to go into a village and line up all the women and children and shoot them. So George said, this is my kind of guy. So he named his oil company Zapata Oil Company, which showed uh, the kind of people that he would like to have around him. And uh, uh, the Zapata Oil Company was never anything but a front for the CIA. They did a lot of work in Mexico and in the Gulf of Mexico uh, for uh, the CIA. And of course, when you had the supposed uh, attack against Castro uh, to, uh, to wipe out communism in Cuba. George was in on the planning, and of course, uh, they bought two ships to, uh, to haul the, the uh, fighters, uh, freedom fighters, to Cuba. And they named one of them Barbara, after his wife, and they named the other ship Zapata, after his oil company. <laughs> so George was pretty well uh, inside all the way. And, uh, of course, they never intended to overthrow Castro. You see, when you set up a regime that you control, like in 1917, they set up the Bolshevik regime, and the American taxpayer ha supported the Soviet uh, empire uh, from 1917 right up till the time it collapsed. And the only reason it collapsed was that the United States was bankrupt. They couldn't send them any more money. So uh, we destroyed communism by going bankrupt ourselves, which I guess is one way of doing it. You said one time, Eustace, that uh, the Russians have been trying to make it through the winter every winter since its inception of the communism, and we've been helping them <laughs> through the winter. Well, the, the guy who helped them first was Herbert Hoover. Uh, after they sent him money, Wilson sent him money, and uh, then they said, we don't have any food. So Herbert Hoover, the great engineer who was a Rothschild employee, after he had been banned for life from the London Stock Exchange as a thief and an embezzler, and the Rothschild said, boy, we want this guy on our side. Sure. So, so they hired him as a director of Rio Tinto Zinc, one of their family firms. And uh, so then uh, in 1916, the Germans said, look, we can't fight any longer. We don't have any more money. We don't have any more food. And we don't have any more coal. So the Rothschilds, the Rothschilds said, well, hang on, and we'll see what we can do. So they got Herbert Hoover to inaugurate the German Relief Commission. But since we were at war with Germany, they couldn't well call it the German Relief Commission, so they called it the Belgian Relief Commission. And uh, the Belgians were suddenly uh, were astounded to find out that they were all starving when they had just had the best crop year they ever had. But anyway, the Belgian Relief Commission, which, by the way, was one of the greatest thieveries uh, in the world, Herbert Hoover and his pals who ran this uh, operation, uh, they all came out of it, multimillionaires. And, uh, Herbert Hoover several times uh, remarked very sourly, some of these days, some prying SOB is going to want to look at our books. Well, no one ever did, and uh, they kept their money. But uh, after the Belgian Relief Commission, which kept the uh, Germany uh, in, in the wo World War I for two more years and brought a very satisfactory conclusion, then uh, they called on Herbert to help them out again. They said, look, the Bolsheviks are starving. Uh, they've shot all the peasants and the farmers, and uh, they have no food. So um, Herbert Hoover then organized Russian relief, and he went over and saved the Bolsheviks from total collapse. And somehow, after this, he became known as a great anti-communist, which just shows you what, when you control the media, you can uh, sell any story that you want. Absolutely. And one of the things that was so sad for me to read about, of course, was the the, uh, when the Bol Bolsheviks did go into the Ukraine and they did kill so many people, they starved between six and eight million Ukrainians out. And this is the end result of what the America has done because America itself, this government, not the country, I don't believe the country used us, I don't believe the patriotic people in the country, but this government was responsible for funding situations like this, weren't they? 